What a great testimony to the power of prayer and of praying people. We're continuing and really finishing our sermon series through our seven measures of a disciple, how we walk in the transformation that comes through Christ. And today we are looking at our last measure, which is that of a knee bender, of a person of deep prayer. And uh, if you have your Bible, you can go ahead and be turning to Joshua chapter 10, Joshua chapter 10. We've uh, been working through these first 10 chapters of Joshua, looking at these measures as they played out in the life of Joshua and as of the Israelite people as they're entering into the promised land. I've thoroughly enjoyed looking at Joshua and these narratives in his life. And certainly uh, this one this morning uh, is one that has always intrigued me and fascinated me. And I hope and pray that as we open up God's Word and dive in, uh, that you will be amazed at the power of prayer. The power of prayer. Uh, I don't know about you if you've ever had a moment in your life in which uh, prayer came alive. That you realize, man, this is incredible. That God hears prayer. That he responds to prayer. That he can do the miraculous through prayer. Uh, I don't know about you, but sometimes for me, it takes that aha moment. It's something that maybe I've heard about for a long time uh, or even practiced a little bit, but it wasn't until something really big happened that I realized, oh, this is not just a, a form that I go through. This is not just a, an action that I participate in. There's something real and powerful here. And for me, that happened as an eighth grade student. I was at summer camp and um, uh, our student pastor was uh, with us and we were playing out on the rec fields in the afternoon on the day before we were about to leave. And this rec field was about the size of two football fields. So just gigantic field, grass everywhere. We were playing ultimate frisbee and flag football and all sorts of stuff. And somewhere in the middle of one of those games, he lost his contact. It fell out of his eye and it looked around a little bit, didn't see it, uh, went about because at that point the game's still going, just jumped back into the game and uh, we finished up. And that night at Church Group Devotions, he said, guys, uh, we've got a little problem. I, I lost my contact this, uh, this afternoon on the rec field and I need it to drive the van home. And we're thinking, oh my goodness, we're leaving in the morning, you know, we, what are we going to do? And so he said, look, I don't know how God's going to work this out, but we just need to take it to the Lord in prayer. And, and honestly, as an eighth grader, I'm thinking in the back of my head, there is no way you're finding that contact. I mean, a contact is just itty bitty. Uh, out on a football field, two football field sized rec field. Uh, but you know what? I said, the group said, let's pray. So we, we started praying and I, I'm sure maybe our student pastor had faith that he was going to find it. So maybe his prayer was the one that the Lord heard. But all a bunch of us seventh and eighth graders crowded around. We all prayed uh, and probably not really believing, not really knowing, not even knowing what to ask for specifically, right? But just praying. God, would you uh, meet this need? God, would you allow us to find this contact? Um, we went on, of course, you know, the end of the night, had our uh, go to bed, got up, had breakfast. And we were getting ready to leave and our student pastor said, I, I got to go back out on the rec field one more time and just look. And uh, now by this time on a, on, a, on a Friday morning, there's dew all over the fields. So like if you thought it was hard to find the contact on a giant plain of grass in the afternoon when the sun was out, when there's nothing shiny or glittering. Imagine trying to find a contact when all you see is dew all across the grass. And honestly, we thought, well, I don't know what you're going to do, but you just get out there and find it. So he walked out there, and I kid you not, 10 minutes later, he comes back and he says, you won't believe this, but as first place I looked, I found it. A contact on a football field full of dew. And he found it. And I remember thinking right then and there, I don't know what you prayed, but I'm going to keep praying. I don't know how God answered that prayer, but boy, he did. Because there's no way in man's power that that could have ever have happened. And so in that moment, I said to myself, God, I, I know you're real, but now I know that you answer prayer. And that really began a journey for me, diving into the depths of what it means to be a knee bender. I hope that you have had some kind of similar experience. And if not, I hope that you will pray that God will give you that type of experience where you see 
God show up in your life through the power of prayer it, when there is no natural way or no feasible human uh, activity that could have caused that outcome. And so that you know that you worship a God and you pray to a God that answers prayer in supernatural ways. And so this morning we're going to see God answer a prayer in a supernatural way. Stand with me this morning as we honor the reading of God's Word in Joshua chapter 10. Joshua chapter 10. As soon as Adonai Zedek, king of Jerusalem, heard how Joshua had captured Ai and had devoted it to destruction, doing to Ai and its king as he had done to Jericho and its king, and how the inhabitants of Gibeon had made peace with Israel and were among them, he feared greatly because Gibeon was a great city. Like, the one of, like one of the royal cities, and because it was greater than Ai, and all of its men were warriors. So Adonai Zedek, king of Jerusalem, sent to Hoam, king of Hebron, to Piram, king of Jermuth, and to Japhia, king of Lashish, and to Debir, king of Eglon, saying, Come up to me and help me, and let us strike Gibeon, for it has made peace with Joshua and with the people of Israel." Then the five kings of the Amorites, the king of Jerusalem, the king of Hebron, the king of Jarmuth, and the king of Lashish, and the king of Eglon gathered their forces and went up with all of their armies and encamped near against Gibeon and made war against it. And the men of Gibeon sent to Joshua at the camp in Gilgal, saying, Do not relax your hand from your servants. Come up to us quickly and save us and help us, for all the kings of the Amorites who dwell in the hill country are gathered against us. So Joshua went up from Gilgal, he and all the people of war with him, and all the mighty men of valor. And the Lord said to Joshua, Do not fear them, for I have given them into your hands. Not a man of them shall stand before you. So Joshua came upon them suddenly, having marched up all night from Gilgal. And the Lord threw them into a panic before Israel, who struck them with a great blow at Gibeon, and chased them by the way of the ascent of Beth Horon, and struck them as far as, as, as Azekah and Mekedah. And as they fled before Israel, while they were going down the ascent of Beth Horon, the Lord threw down large stones from heaven on them as far as Azekah, and they died. There were more who died because of the hailstones than the sons of Israel killed with the sword. Now here's where we pick up with where we're going to preach from. At that time, Joshua spoke to the Lord. In the day when the Lord gave the Amorites over to the sons of Israel, and he said in the sight of Israel, Sun, stand still at Gibeon, and moon in the valley of Ajalon. And the sun stood still, and the moon stopped until the nation took vengeance on their enemies. Is this not written in the book of Jashar? The sun stopped in the midst of heaven and did not hurry to set for about a whole day. There has been no day like it before or since when the Lord heeded the voice of a man, for the Lord fought for Israel. So Joshua re returned and all Israel with him to the camp at Gilgal. Father, we thank you for your word. Oh, that we would be a people of prayer. That we would read not only this story, but all the stories of prayer in the Scripture and see that you are a God that hears from your people. You are a God that responds when we call upon your name. You are a God who can do the miraculous. Oh God, forgive us when we think that we can do something in our own strength, when we can move something with our own power. Father, help us to be reminded that we are to pray without ceasing, to constantly, every single day, recognize your presence and your power in our lives every moment of the day. Help us not to be afraid to ask, for your word says, ask and ye shall receive. And so Father, I pray that we are an asking people because you are a giving God. And Father, I pray today that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart would be pleasing and acceptable unto you, for you're my rock and my redeemer. And I pray this in the matchless and glorious name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Now this morning I want to give us five attributes or five characteristics of a knee bender. Uh, in order to do that, I do want us to jump back into chapter 9 briefly because I want to set up the context for what's happened here. 
Uh, we finished last week in chapter 8, and what we saw as we were talking about being generous givers is that Achan had kept some of the things that belonged to God when, they, when the city of Jericho was destroyed, and he had hidden them in his tent. And so, therefore, they had disobeyed the instructions of God. And so, the next battle was uh, the city of Ai. And so, they go and they lose this battle. Um, because God is, is, uh, is d- discouraged and they, uh, God's not discouraged. God is upset with the people and he wants to teach them about dependence upon him and, and his faithfulness to them. And so what happens is Achan is discovered, he's punished, Ai is then captured and they're moving on to the next city, the Gibeonites. Now the Gibeonites are smart people and they start looking out and they're like, wait a minute. Jericho is a big city and it fell down at the hand of God. Ai is a okay big city and it fell down at the hands of God. We're in big trouble. And so the Gibeonites come up with this plan. They said, let's make a deal with Israel. If we make a deal with Israel, God will, uh, not protect, God will protect us and the Israelites will not attack us. And so that's exactly what they do. And we pick up there under this first principle, which is that knee benders make a big mistake when they fail to pray. Knee benders make a big mistake when they fail to pray. Look at verse 14 of chapter 9. So the men took some of their provisions, but did not ask counsel from the Lord. So the Gibeonites come to Joshua and they said, let's make a deal. You and I will, enter, you and uh, the Isra- us and the Israelites will enter into covenant together that you will not attack us. We will be with you. You will be with us. We'll be on the same team. And it says there, and he did not ask counsel from the Lord. What did Joshua do? He looked out at the situation and he said, oh, it sounds good to me. Uh, it makes sense to me. Uh, you, you just uh, are little and <clears throat> you can be our servants. And that end up, ends up being what happens. They, the Gibeonites end up becoming uh, servants of the Israelites. But that's not the instruction that God had given Joshua. He had said you're to go in and you are to take possession of all of the land. You're not to, to leave anything behind. And so here Joshua makes a deal that he did not consult the Lord on. And sometimes we think about life and we do the exact same thing, don't we? We go through life thinking, I've got this. That makes sense to me. I know how this works. That'll be an advantage to me. This will move the cause forward. And we don't take time to take it to the Lord in prayer. And I found that the things that I fail to take to the Lord in prayer oftentimes blow up in my face. The time that I don't spend asking what the Lord's direction or will is are the things that blow up in my face and probably the same for you. We make a big mistake when we fail to pray. And guess what? This is exactly what happens. And God has to intervene. And so he makes this deal with the Gibeonites. And all of the other towns around start looking around and they're like, wait a minute. What's going on here? And so they said, we've got a plan. And so all these other hillside communities uh, get together and they form an alliance. And they said, let's attack the Gibeonites and see whether or not Israel will come to their aid. And if they do, we will destroy them. And that sets up then chapter 10. So the first principle is that we make a big mistake when we fail to pray. The second characteristic is that knee benders understand that the relationship, that relationship is foundational for prayer. Uh, relationship is the foundation of prayer. We pray to God out of a relationship with him. He desires to know us and to be known by us, that we have interaction with us, that we communicate. Look at verse 12. It says, at that time, Joshua spoke to the Lord. Now, he sees the the uh, hillside communities gathering together in an alliance against the Gibeonites. And he says, oh no, I've made a deal with the Gibeonites. We have to protect the Gibeonites. And so now he says, oh no, I've got to go to the Lord. And so it says, Joshua spoke to the Lord. Let me ask you a question. When's the last time you spoke to the Lord? You shared your concerns You voiced your frustrations. You laid your request at his feet. You recognize that he is sovereign and powerful and good and loving and responds to his people when they pray. When's the last time you cast your cares upon the Lord? I love that it says Joshua spoke 
to the Lord. Now, speaking is a powerful tool. It is a, the primary tool of communication. Now, I know that a lot in, in, of our students and even college students think that the primary form of communication is text messages. Like, I'm getting this with my 20-year-old daughter. Like, I'll text her, how was your day? Guess what I get? Fine. Anything exciting happening in your life right now? No. Do you, uh, you know, do, do you have any plans for the weekend? No. This is the response that I get from my, my child. Now, if I call her or if she calls me, guess what? We get more out of that. I can ask follow-up questions. I can say, what do you mean? No, you're not doing anything. And then she'll have to explain it. Now, sometimes I th- know she feels exasperated probably when I try to draw out more information. But when we talk, there is a deeper level of communication than when we text. And I, I'm fearful that a lot of our prayer lives have become just like a text. God, I need you to do this. And what we expect from him is yes or no. Or he says to us, I want you to do this. And we just ignore the text, right? We don't even pay. Like, I'll respond later when I get a chance to. Like, it's, it's, that's not what God desires from us. He desires relationship, that there's connection, that it's okay to share what's on your heart, what's on your mind, what's going on in your life. You might be walking through a difficult time right now. You might be angry with God right now. Do you know that the scripture is full of prayers? Some of the prayers, God, those people are asking God to intervene in their life. Sometimes they're asking him to intervene in their health. Sometimes they're asking him to intervene in their finances. Sometimes they're asking him to, to show up in a powerful way or to do something powerful. There's all sorts of prayers. There's even prayers in the Psalms where the psalmist just complains. He just says, God, why are you letting this happen? God, why are you doing this? God, where are you? God, why is this happening to me? And you know what? God is big enough that his sho- and his shoulders are broad enough. He can handle no matter what you say. He is big enough. If you come to him in faith and you are sincere about seeking him, even if you're mad, even if you're frustrated, even if you're broken, he says, come to me. Come to me. I just want to hear from you. I just want to know what's on your heart, what's on your mind. Why? Because he desires relationship. He desires relationship. And great prayer always flows out of relationship. Joshua spoke to the Lord. I love what Charles Spurgeon said. He says, true prayer is neither a mere mental exercise nor a vocal performance. It's not just something we do in our head. It's not just something we recite out of our mouth. He says, it is a far, it's far deeper than that. It is a spiritual transaction with the creator of heaven and earth. When it says that Joshua spoke to the Lord, that just means Joshua spoke to Yahweh. He spoke to the one who spoke him into creation. He spoke to the one that formed him in his mother's womb. He spoke to the one who spoke in the heavens and the earth were created in instantaneously. He's not just speaking to another human. He's not just speaking out loud. He's speaking to God. Do we realize what tool we have in prayer that we can speak to the God of the universe? I think if we did realize that, we'd certainly do it more often than we do. Third characteristic of a knee bender is that they ask for big things because they trust a big God. They ask for big things because they trust a big God. Several months ago, actually it was back in January, during our um, 21 days of prayer, I started praying this prayer. I started praying, God, would you give our church the $4.1 million that we need to pay off our debt? Now, I don't have $4.1 million in my bank account, so I can't write that check, right? Uh, if, if you have that in your checking account, I would be more than glad to meet you after the service right out in the lobby. But I bet most of you don't have that in your checking account either. But you know who owns everything? God. You know who could have $4.1 million show up in that wooden box at the end of the service? God. And I believe that to my core, that he could do it. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills, and he owns the hills. 
And he can make and do whatever he desires to do. And I just decided I was going to pray a big prayer. I'm still praying it. I invite you, if you'd like to join me in that prayer, would you pray that with me? I'm praying that God would do something big. Now, maybe you've done that in your life. Uh, There's been other times, personally, I've prayed for God to show up in a big way. Maybe you need to do that. Maybe you need to ask God to do something big. I think a lot of times what limits our prayer is that we ask for things that might have happened anyway. We ask for things that we could do ourselves. Or we ask for things that aren't part of the will and plan of God. Why? Because we don't have a relationship or our relationship is not thriving. And so we're asking out of our own flesh for things that will help us and us alone. But I believe we ought to ask big things from God because he is capable. Look what Joshua asked. At that time, Joshua spoke to the Lord in the day when the Lord gave the Amorites over to the sons of Israel. And he said in the sight of Israel, Sun, stand still at Gibeon, and moon in the valley of Ajalon. Now, my friends, I don't know about you, but $4.1 million prayer is a tiny prayer in comparison to asking God to keep the sun up for an extra day. Like, that kind of prayer, honestly, would never even cross my mind, right? And we would naturalize that, well, that can't happen. Not that God can't do that. Why would I believe something that crazy? Pastor, don't you know if God allowed the sun to stay in the sky, that would mean the earth would stop spinning. And if the earth stopped spinning, then we wouldn't be dead. And we'd have every scientific excuse under the sun why God couldn't do what God says that he do, what can do. And I get it, man. I, I'm there with you. I, I have those fleshly tendencies too. And so I don't ask for big things because I immediately start thinking about all the reasons why God can't do it or God wouldn't do it. And that's not at all what prayer is. Prayer is asking God to do big things because we believe he's a big God and he's capable. I'm going to give you a couple examples from Scripture. James chapter 5, verse 17, Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. Now, if you've ever read any of the stories of Elijah, you realize that Elijah did a bunch of miracles. God did a bunch of miracles through Elijah's ministry. And yet, what does it start with? Elijah was a man just like us. So if he was just like us, what differentiated the work of God in Elijah's life from the work of God in your life? Well, let's keep going. He prayed fervently that it might not rain. He must have been praying here for a bit. And then for three years and six months, it did not rain on the earth. And then he prayed again and heaven gave rain and the earth bore its fruit. Again, nature is under the sovereign control of God. And so what did Elijah do? He prayed and said, God, withhold the rain. And what did God do? He withheld the rain. And then he prayed, God, give the rain. And what did God do? God gave the rain. Again, reminder, reminder, he is no different than you and I. That's the first part of the verse that James start with. He's a man like you. He's a man like me. He's a human. He's not God. He doesn't control the control nature or the clouds or the rain or the sun or anything. But he knows the one who does. And so he prays and God responds. Or in Mark chapter 11, verse 22, Jesus says this, Have faith in God. Truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will come to pass, it will be done for him. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. This is Jesus saying, why do you pray such small things? Why do you pray with no faith? Why do you don't believe that God can do it? Because if you pray, God can do it. Now, let's pause for a second because sometimes I think we say, we start coming back to our flesh and go, well, I prayed for this and God didn't do it. Or I asked God to do this, and he, he didn't do it. Sometimes God doesn't do something, because it, it, not because we didn't ask, but because we don't have enough faith. That's certainly a possibility. That's what the Scripture says. But sometimes we ask, and it's not in accordance with God's will. And so his answer is no. Sometimes he answers no. That doesn't mean he didn't answer at all. 
it means he answered no. And that is okay too because sometimes he answers no because only he knows what the future is. And if he answered yes, then what we would face beyond that point, we may, may be far worse than what we think we're facing now. And it is out of his grace and out of his mercy and out of his kindness that he's saying no now to prevent something far greater from happening in the future. We don't know. I don't know. I don't see the future. You don't see the future. But God knows the future. And so we have to trust that when we pray and the answer is no, that it is no for a reason. There are sometimes I have to tell my children no, and I don't want to explain every single thing behind the answer no. Because they're either not capable of understanding it at their age or whatever the situation may be. It may be that we're not spiritually mature enough to understand why the answer is no. And God is protecting us from our own flesh, our own worldliness. We don't know. There is another reason why God may say no. James chapter 4 verse 2. He says, you do not have because you do not ask. You ask and you do not receive because you ask wrongly. What's the wrong way to ask? To spend it on your own passions. So when we pray, we are to say what Jesus said. Not my will, but thy will be done, right? Not to benefit me, not for my own pleasure, not for my own comfort, but in order that your kingdom may thrive and that you may be glorified. And so when we go to the Lord in prayer, we're asking God, do your work. God, your glory, your renown, your fame, that's at the forefront of my prayer. So when I'm asking God, God, give our church $4.1 million, I'm not asking it so that we can go and spend it on our own pleasure, so that we can take all the church members on a cruise somewhere. That's not what we're asking. Why are we asking God for $4.1 million? More money for missions. More money to send people around the world to preach the gospel. More money to help people who are in need in our city. More opportunities to plant churches. That's why we're asking. Not so we can send money to the bank in interest payments, but so that we can invest the money in the kingdom. Not for our pleasure, but for his kingdom. We want to ask in order that we uh, cannot spend it on our own selfishness, but on the formation and forward thinking and movement of the gospel. Ian Bounds, the great writer on prayer, said, we pray feebly because we live feebly. We pray feebly because we live feebly. Are you asking God for big things and trusting that he can do big things? Fourth, knee benders believe that God acts and moves in the spiritual and the supernatural. How many of you got up this morning thinking about the spiritual realm? The supernatural realm. I, I bet not a lot of us. I bet a lot of us got up this morning, looked out the window and said, is it, is it still raining out there? Or I wonder if they've opened up that road yet. Or I wonder if the power's still out. We start thinking about the natural. I wonder what I'm going to do for lunch this afternoon. If my uh, power's still out, what am I going to go out somewhere? What am I, what am I? We, we get up and think most of our day about the natural, Right? And, and I get it. We live in a natural world. God created that natural world. But this is the other side of that, is that there is a spiritual world, a supernatural world going on at the same time. In fact, Paul says that our battle is not against flesh and blood. There, there's a spiritual realm, a spiritual battle going on that most of us go the entire day and never hardly ever think about. But prayer catapults us into the spiritual. That's a, one of the great things about prayer. It moves us from the natural to the spiritual, to the supernatural. Look at verse 12. At that time, Joshua spoke to the Lord in the day when the Lord gave the Amorites over to the sons of Israel. And he said in the sight of Israel, sun stand still at Gibeon and moon in the valley of Ajalon. And the sun stood still and the moon stopped until the nation took vengeance on their enemies. And so God held the daylight longer than it should have been held in order for the Israelites to defeat the enemy. 
Joshua prayed, God, give us more time, give us more sunlight. And what did God do? Exactly that. He held the sun in the sky and did not let it go down until the enemies were defeated. It says, is this not written in the book of Jashar? The sun stopped in the midst of heaven and did not hurry to set for about a whole day. Now, I want to just pause because, again, we can look at that and go, how in the world could that possibly be? The account of the sun standing still in Joshua 10 is primarily about the movement of God and his power when we pray. That's the setup to the verse, right? Before God does the miracle, what does it say? And Joshua spoke to the Lord. And so we know that this is an outflow of prayer. You might be saying, well, he was just praying. At the end of the verse, which we'll get to in a minute, it says that God heard the voice of Joshua and did what Joshua asked him to do. So we know on both sides of this story, this miraculous movement of God, that it was about prayer. Joshua asked and God did. But what we do when we read stories like this, at least me, is that we sometimes start asking, well, how did God do it? Like I said earlier, like, well, how could the earth stop spinning? How could the earth stop moving? How did God keep the sun up when the sun should have been down? How did God do it? And we start wrestling and then we get all scientific and we start saying, there's no way. It can't happen. Everybody would die. This would happen. That would happen. This would happen. And I do the same thing, but here's the problem. When we start focusing on the how, we forget the why. And the why is that because Joshua prayed. There's a supernatural thing that's happening here. And so when I get to places like this in the text, I use two basic principles to approach the how questions of Scripture. Because I don't want to miss out on the why. So if I have uh, some basic principles to, to help me think through the how, then I can keep my focus on the why. So here's the first thing I think about when I think about the how. Uh, the first principle is that the scripture is the plumb line of truth. Since God was the one who performed the miracle and had it recorded in his word, we ought to trust that he did what he said he did. We ought to trust that God does what he says he does. And that in this case, he did what he said he did. So if I start with God's word is true, then I can keep my focus on the why. Because if I start figuring out, trying to figure out the how, I'll miss the why. So I start with, well, what God said, he said, and what he did, he did. I start with that as the basis of truth. Psalm, 1, Psalm 11, 160. The sum of your word is truth. If that is the bedrock, if that is the starting point for understanding passages like this, you can't go wrong. God does what he says he does. But the second principle that I use is, is, is around the idea of the supernatural versus the natural. So we should read the miracles of God as plainly as possible. While also understanding that the intent of the text is not to be a scientific explanation. God is not here to have to explain to you all of the scientific reasons and ways that he does certain things. Now, that's not to say we should not study and explore all that science has to teach us. God has put us in a natural world, and we ought to do our very best to understand the natural world that he has put us in. But when we attempt to approach the miracles of God strictly with a scientific approach, we will miss the why of the miracle. This is because, listen to this carefully, science is the study of natural law. It is based on what is repeatable, observable, and verifiable. But miracles present none of those qualities because they're not natural. By very nature, they are supernatural. And if something is supernatural, it cannot be looked at or defined in a natural way. That's the very definition of supernatural. It is above what is natural. You cannot explain the supernatural through the natural. Trying to explain how God caused the sun to stand still is no different than trying to explain how God spoke the world into existence or how Moses parted the Red Sea or how Elijah called down fire on the prophets of Baal or how Jesus was raised from the dead on the third day. We believe these miracles by faith because the scripture speaks clearly of them being done by the power of God in a supernatural way. So if you're coming up to me afterwards and say, well, how did God hold the sun in the sky and keep the moon? I don't know. But this is what I know. 
He did it because he holds the universe in his hands. And it's not a big deal to him. He spoke the sun into existence. And as we look at the sky and all of the stars, we realize the sun is just one of many, many, many thousands, millions of suns. It's just a small thing to God. What we see is a big thing God holds as a small thing. He's, that wasn't a big deal. No big deal. I've spoken into existence. Why can I not make it shine longer? Of course you can, God. It's supernatural. And you know what? This is not the only time he does something with the sun. I love it when I read scripture and I'm reading some commentaries and I come across something and it says, also see, and it tells me another passage. And then I'm like, I, I, I've never, I never even thought about that. I, I've read the book of 2 Kings probably 10 to 15 times since I've read through the Bible. And I'm reading the commentary about this passage in Joshua and it says something like, also such, a, such as also happens in 2 Kings chapter 20. And I'm thinking, 2 Kings chapter 20? I don't remember anything in the Bible in 2 Kings chapter 20 about the sun standing still. What, what in the world? So, of course, I get my Bible and I flick over to 2 Kings chapter 20. And I just, maybe you remember this when you read through the Bible, but somehow I've read through it 15 times. It never dawned on me. But here's what 2 Kings chapter 20 says. In those days, Hezekiah became sick and was at the point of death. And Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos, came to him and said, Thus says the Lord, set your house in order, for you shall die, you shall not recover. Then Hezekiah turned his face to the wall, and here it is, prayed to the Lord. So I love this story already because it's also about prayer, that God's miracle is in response to prayer. So it says, then Hezekiah turned his face to the wall and prayed to the Lord saying, now, O Lord, please remember how I have walked before you in faithfulness and with a whole heart and have done what is good in your sight. And Hezekiah wept bitterly. And before Isaiah had gone out into the middle court, the word of the Lord came to him, turn back and say to Hezekiah, the leader of my people, thus says the Lord, the God of David, your father, I have heard your prayer. I have seen your tears. Behold, I will hear you, heal you. And on the third day, you shall go up from the house of the Lord and I will add 15 years to your life. I will deliver you and this city out of the hand of the king of Assyria, and I will defend this city for my own sake and for my servant David's sake. And Isaiah said, bring a cake of figs and let them take it and lay it on the boil and that, that, you, that he may recover. And Hezekiah said to Isaiah, what shall be the sign that the Lord will heal me and that I shall go up to the house of the Lord on the third day? And listen to this. And Isaiah said, this shall be the sign to you from the Lord that the Lord will do the thing that he has promised. Shall the shadow go forward 10 steps or go back 10 steps? And Hezekiah answered, it is an easy thing for the shadow to lengthen 10 steps. Rather, let the shadow go back 10 steps. And Isaiah the prophet called to the Lord and he brought the shadow back 10 steps by which it had gone down on the steps of Ahaz. Think about this. So when the sun is in the sky, this is why sundials work, right? The sun shines and the shadow moves in one direction as time passes. Why? Because we know now, and they didn't always know that then, but the earth is moving, right? And so because the earth is moving and the sun is set in a still spot, then what happens is that as the earth moves, the shadow of something moves, right? And it only moves in one direction. Why? Because the earth is spinning in one direction. And so what happens here is he says, I need a sign. And what is the sign? Cause the shadow to move backwards. Now, if we're going to get scientific here, what has to happen for the, sun, for the shadow to move backwards? The earth has to rotate the other direction. Well, how did that happen? Well, who knows? Could God do it another way? Who knows? Certainly he could, right? But here's what we do know. God caused the shadow on the stairs to move backward. Once again, displaying that he has power over the natural. Again, if we spend all our time thinking about how God did it, we will miss the why God did it. 
And I believe God wants to focus uh, us to focus on the why he did it, to remind us that he is sovereign over all things, that he holds all creation in the palm of his hands, and that he works in the spiritual and in the supernatural. Fifth and finally, knee benders understand that prayer moves the hand that moves the world. Prayer moves the hand that moves the world. Look at verse 14. There has been no day like it before or since when the Lord, listen to this, heeded the voice of a man. For the Lord fought for Israel. The Lord heeded the voice of a man. The Lord listened to the prayer of Joshua and did what he asked. Oh, that God would want to do what we ask. That he would want to lavish good things of his character, of his nature, of his power upon his children who call upon him by faith. That they believe and trust that he is moving the hand that moves the world. John Wesley once said, God does nothing but by prayer and everything with it. He does nothing but by prayer and everything with it. Oh, that God would do everything that he would do as Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 4 in his prayer. He could do more than we can ask or imagine. I don't know about you, but I can ask and imagine some pretty big things. And that doesn't even begin to scratch the surface of what God is capable of doing if we will pray. And so I begin, I finish with where we begin. What is your prayer life like? What does your knee bending look like? Are you seeking God in relationship? Do you believe that he is able and that he is willing and that he wants to respond to the needs and requests of you and I and the people of God? Of course he does. But are we asking? Are we seeking him? Are we striving after him? Are we asking boldly before him, trusting that he will and that he can? My prayer for you and for me is that we will not be afraid to go before the throne room of grace, as the writer of Hebrews says, with confidence. Not a confidence in us, but a confidence in him. Now, you might be thinking this morning, well, I don't even know where to begin. Well, let me tell you, the first place to begin is in relationship with him. First and foremost, you need to trust Jesus as your Lord and as your Savior. Jesus is the access into the throne room of grace. He bought through his death, burial, and resurrection access into the throne room of God. And he invites all who trust in him to come into God's throne room through his broken body and his shed blood. And so I begin with saying, do you know Jesus? If the answer is no, I invite you to trust him today. I invite you to call upon his name. He will respond when you call upon him in faith. If you do know him this morning, I ask you, what's your prayer life like? Are you asking God to move? Are you asking God to do big things? If not, I challenge you this week. Put some things before him. Watch and see that he's good. Watch and see that he will respond. Watch and see that he is powerful.